All right, we're ready to start. Um, this is the third in a series of history of Jewish art. And the first two of the series are already on our website. If you want to go to bstc.us, that's bstc.us. Right in the middle, there's a uh, word videos. Just click on it and you'll be able to see the first two. You'll be able to see the recording of this in uh, two or three days when I get around to doing it. All right, and I do brief introductions. So here's Adrian, you're on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adrian O'Hare, and this talk is brought to you by Congregation Anchi Israel and the Adult Education Committee, of which I am a member. I'm going to um, close my video so that my face doesn't glare at you during the talk. So, welcome. And today we're going to look at some of the most famous artists, all of whom were Jewish. And each one, frankly, deserves an entire art essay devoted to them. So today's talk, again, is like a little nosh. Um, and I hope you enjoy. Today, we'll enter the world of abstraction. Modern artists, through their art, intended to create a deeper understanding of reality. With the advent of the modern era, and it said uh, mid 19th century, the focus of art shifted from representational imagery to the less tangible arena of ideas, emotions, and direct personal experience. Many factors contributed to this movement of, of artists away from pictures that showed people, places, and things. And one of the major ones is considered the, the Industrial Revolution, uh, thereby the invention of photography, electricity, and psychology. And suddenly, there was a new world stocked with individual forces, electric forces, invisible forces. And then there was the unconscious mind, now open to explore, as well as Jewish mysticism. Abstract artists use a visual language of shape, form, color, and the line to create art forms that can completely dissolve into a purely visual experience. Abstract artists, artists and uh, intentions were to communicate through the senses and the mind to reach beyond to a deeper understanding of reality. So let's start back by reaching back again into um, uh, the way in, in our past to year 244, um, to this painting, The Vision of Ezekiel. This painting was designed also to reach beyond to a deeper understanding of reality. This ancient depiction of Ezekiel's dream is from the Dora Europa Synagogue, the earliest known biblical narrative paintings. They were discovered in Eastern Syria. In 1928, there was another date of 1932, so you'll find both. And the piece and the wall that it came from was dated from an aromatic inscription that said 244. It is unique in that it preserves virtually intact. Um, the colors are brilliant um, and the wall is as it was um, all those years ago. I chose this particular painting as a way of introducing our first artist, David Bomberg. David Bomberg wanted to create a new visual language to express his perceptions of modern industrial city. He wrote, 
this new life should find its expression in a new art, which has been stimulated by new perceptions. And I wrote here, I want to translate this new life, its motions, its machinery into art that should not be photographic, but expressive. He was the fifth of 11 children born to opposed Jewish parents in Birmingham, England, and he grew up in Whitechapel, which was the heart of immigrant life at that time. And he began, became absorbed into an artist group known as the Whitechapel Boys. He was described as one of the most audacious of the exceptional generation of artists who studied at the Slate School of Art. But alas, he was expelled in 1913 because of his refusal to submit to any particular genre. Interestingly, Bamberg worked in all phases of modern abstraction. He's done cubism, abstract expressionism, modernism, futurism, fauvism. Essentially, he defied definition. He wouldn't stick to one genre be, and be, uh, because he believed in interweaving so many elements of color, line, and shape. Uh, there are seven visions of the prophet Ezekiel who was uh, expelled from Judah to Babylon. This work depicts a vision in which God guides the prophet Ezekiel to a valley of bones and asks, can these dry bones live? Bomberg's composition shows stick-like figures, lifelike and animated at the same time. The bright discontinuity of the colors adds to this sense of resurrection. Bomberg chose this subject after the sudden death of his mother, with whom he was very close. Dance was an important subject for many of the artists associated with the emergence of modern art. Bomberg's interest was probably prompted by the Russian ballet's visit to London in 1911, and he became very close with a dancer in the troupe. Over the next two years, he produced works on this subject in chalk, charcoal, watercolor, ink, and gouache paint, as well as lithograph prints. These are among Bromberg's most abstract work. They reflect the modern rhythms and movement of the Russian ballet. After the Second World War, after his experience in war, he adapted more figurative approach and his work is dominated by portraits and landscapes. Bomberg was neglected uh, in his lifetime. He wasn't even noticed by his peers, but today he is recognized as one of the 20th century's leading British artists. It actually wasn't until eight, 1988, over 30 years after his death, that the Tay held the first solo exhibition of his work. Critics have described him as having probably the most original, radical, stubborn intelligence to be found in art schools. This uh, next artist has a motto, which I found worthy of. Um, repeating. He said that whatever the apparent aim of the artist, he is called upon first to move the spectator. And his name was Osip Zakin. And I'd like to see above his name is his original birth name. He was truly an unclassified and prolific artist. He's done sculptures, gouaches, drawings, and etchings, as well as lithographs. 
Today, we'll be viewing his lithographs that were all done in his 70s. He was born in, um, let me go back to his picture so I can talk more about him. Uh, he was born in Belarus and became a French nationalized citizen. He is of Jewish and Scottish descent and spent his childhood in a circle of cultured and assimilated Jews. While staying with his mother's relatives in, North, in Northern England in 1905, he attended the local art school and taught himself to carve furniture ornamentation. At the age of 16, he continued his artistic training in London and made a living as an ornamental carver. During this period of time, he became friendly with painter David Blumberg, um, and he settled in Paris in 1910. He studied at the Ecole de Beaux Arts, and guess where he lived? He lived in La Rouche, the, the, the commune that we talked about in the first talk. During World War I, Zakin was wounded in action while he served as a stretcher bearer. And he spent World War II, uh, the period of World War II in America. Zakin turned towards politically motivated subject following his service in the French military during World War I. Certainly this um, um, title invites conversation and it's the human marionette, how we each control each other. And this one deserves some conversation too. It's called the conversation on how we interact with one another and how we're bound to one another. Zakin passed away in 1967 at the age of 77. Today, his works are in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, the Tate Gallery in London, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Los Angeles County Museum, uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Mason Klein, the curator at the Jewish Museum in New York, suggested that this next artist may have been the first Jewish avant-garde artist. Let me introduce you to Man Ray, who I didn't know was Jewish when I started this research. His birth name is up here. The artist known as Man Ray was an American visual artist who spent most of his life in Paris. He had multiple artistic identities over the course of his life. He was considered a New York Dadaist. In Paris, he was considered a Parisian surrealist. He was considered an international portraitist and a fashion photographer. And he produced important works as photographer, painter, filmmaker, and writer. But Ray considered himself a painter above all, and that's the works we will see today. He never revealed his turn of the century American Jewish immigrant experience. And he refused to acknowledge that he ever had a name other than Man Ray. He willfully, he, his willful construction of his own artistic persona and his cultural ambiguity probably allowed him to become the first American artist to be accepted by Paris avant-garde artists. Man Ray was born in South Philadelphia. He was the eldest child of Russian Jewish immigrants. In 1897, the family settled in, Brook in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which is where my grandparents lived. In early 1912, the Ronitsky family changed their surname to Ray in reaction to ethnic discrimination and anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism was very prevalent at this time. 
A man, Emmanuel, who was called Manny as a nickname, changed his first name to Man and gradually began, began to use Man Ray as his name. Now, many of the artists I have presented in this series have changed their name. Jewish name changing showed us the reach of anti-Semitism during this period of time. I knew him as a remarkably interesting photographer who created exotic pictures. The series that I'm going to highlight uh, uh, for this talk was considered by Ray to be his ultimate achievement in his, in his personal development as an artist and the culmination of his creative vision. Uh, the works in this little collection are based on drawings and, photo and photographs of 19th century mathematical models he made and uh, that he photographed in 1930s. These paintings are from the Philadelphia collection in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem, and they came and they were featured on the occasion of that of the Israeli Museum's 100th anniversary, and that was in February of 2015. The exhibit was called Man Ray. Human Equations, A Journey from Mathematics to Shakespeare. Now, study, study some of these things and see if you recognize some of the objects. Man Ray's father worked as a garment factory, in a garment factory, and he ran a small tailoring business out of the family house. All of the children assisted him from an early age. Man Ray's mother designed and made the family's clothes from the leftover swatches of fabric. Man Ray wished to disassociate himself from his family background, but tailoring left an enduring mark. Items related to tailoring like mannequins, flat irons, swatches of material, and other things appear in almost every medium of his work. Art historians have noted similarity between Ray's collage and painting techniques and the styles used in tailoring. I recognize this. I, 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 just from my childhood when my mother was making something. Um, and we'll see other things in, the, in, in some of these. Art and science was a significant component of modern art at the beginning of the 20th century. In 1930, Max Ernst, a friend of uh, Ray's, encouraged Ray to explore models of mathematical equations. At first, Ray photographed the objects, and this is one of them in the corner. He was, and he used dramatic lighting to bring out their angles and shadows and grooves. And from this, he um, created the Merry Wives of Windsor. And then um, he did these pieces of work in the 40s, long after he left occupied France and moved to the United States. He revisited the photographs of these models that he had taken in the 30s and he made paintings based on them. Uh, and from that, he got the title, Human Equations. Now, this model is, a, 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 it's a model of imaginary and real part of the derivation of the Weistrass function. That's this model. And it became this, the Merry Widows. Um, the models themselves were made around 1980 and are simply beautiful. And if you're not a mathematician, which I am not, um, they're simply incomprehensible. Uh, but here we are with Julius Caesar. Our next artist was more interested 
in the sublime. This artist's goals for his work was that they evoke the awesome feeling a person has when faced with the unknowable or the sublime. He believed that human beings could overcome the terror of the unknowable by engaging in the, in the creative process. I'd like to introduce you to Barnett Newman. He is seen as one of the major figures in abstract expressionism and one of the foremost artists of color field painters. Um, he was considered one of the most intellectual artists of the New School, New York School. The New York School was a, a, a group of painters, a circle of painters that emerged during the 40s as a new collective voice in American art. By the way, 13 of the 16 New School uh, artists were Jewish. Newman was born and raised in New York, the son of Polish Jewish immigrants. His approach to making art was shaped by his study of the Kabbalah and classes in philosophy at City College of New York. He was around 30 when he started painting, having spent the previous decade teaching, writing, studying, and working in his father's menwear store. Like other abstract expressionists, Newman's early works show the influence of surrealism and biomorphism. Biomorphism is when you're using organic forms. They seem to, uh, to evoke cosmic and mythological themes Themes of beginnings and origins. This is the song of Orpheus and it makes reference to the power of art to heal and restore life. And aha, with this painting called One Meant, Newman found his voice. It was in this work that he hit upon what would become the signature motif that defines all his paintings to come. It was a vertical band connecting the upper and the lower margins of the painting. <coughs> I'm sorry, and he called it a zip. The concept of zips was profound and significant for Newman, according to this article by Larry Silver, and I'm gonna quote, principle among Newman's concepts is zimzum, from the Hebrew word zimzum, which means contraction, constriction, condensation. It is the Kabbalistic idea that divine creation results from a process of voluntary contraction and constriction. Silva suggests that Newman illustrates this profound concept by his zips, which underscore and serves as markers for differentiating space and creating the Jewish concept of place. And we're back in rabbinical literature, this process of tzum tzim created a conceptual place, a vacant place into which new creative life could be. And it is God who is often referred to as the place. He is the place of the world, but the world is not his place. This painting is um, a title means man, heroic and sublime. Newman quotes, is quoted as saying, 
what is the explanation of a seemingly insane drive of man to be a painter and a poet if it is not an act of defiance against man's fall from grace and an assertion that he returned to the Garden of Eden. Newman wanted his paintings to be an ideograph of the idea of original creation. In his writing, he defined ideograph as direct expression of that image it's not uh, his the concept is not expressed through a title or a name it is not expressed through substitute images uh, or through a symbol but the image and the idea are to be one and no uh, explanation is or translation is necessary one of the largest paintings that he made was this 28 wide by nine feet tall painting called Anna's Light, painted in honor of his mother after she died. An unnamed company bought this painting by Newman for $105.7 million in 2013. That's $105.7 million from the owner of a Japanese chemical company who had bought it originally. Um, Newman's work can be seen at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Whitney Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the, the Museum of Art um, and the Modern Museum of Art, just to name a few. Our next artist sought a high philosophical truth. He said, we favor simple expression of a complex thought. This artist's work is distinguished by concentration on pure pictorial properties such as color, the texture of the surface, proportions and scale. He believes those elements can disclose the presence of a high philosophical truth. And this is his original name, his birth name. And this is the name that we know him by. Um, he was an American abstract painter of Litvin, uh, Latvian Jewish descent and one of the premier artists of his generation. During a career that spanned five decades, he created a new and impassioned form of abstract painting. His father was a pharmacist and an intellectual and insisted that his older children have a secular and political rather than religious upbringing. According to Rothko, his father was at one time a violently anti-religious guy. But in an environment where Jews were often blamed for many of the evils that befell Russia, Rothko's early childhood was plagued by fear. Despite the family's modest income, they were highly educated and um, Rothko spoke Lithuanian, Yiddish, Hebrew, and Russian. Ultimately, Rothko's family uh, father rediscovered his Orthodox Judaism of his youth, and Rothko, the last of the four siblings, the youngest of the four siblings, was sent to Cheda. He was sent at the age of five. And there he studied uh, the Talmud. Um, um, and that was his, he, he did not go to secular school after that. In a, biog a biography of uh, Mark Rothko, which is called Towards the Light in the Chapel by Anne Cohn Solow, the author says, 
that Rothko's artistic quest was a pursuit of Takim Olam, repairing the world. Her thesis is that Judaism and Talmud was central to Rothko's work. She states that Rothko was, and I quote, a radical but disciplined scholar who used the rhetorical tools of the Talmud and the tradition and its tradition of study. During, um, during the 40s, Rothko's imagery became increasingly symbolic and was devoted to themes of myths and prophecy and ritual and the, un, uh, the unconscious mind. In, this, in that period of time, there was a climate of anxiety that dominated the late 30s and the years of World War II. Rothko's painting of the middle 40s are characterized by more biomorphic style because he felt a new idiom was uh, needed to be found because of all of the angst and uh, fear in the world. And so he found one. All reference to the natural world disappeared entirely from Rothko's painting in the late 40s, 1940s. And asymmetrical arranged patches of color became the basis of his composition. Rothko relied on shapes and color to convey emotional states, emotional states, atmospheres, and moods. He said, we favor the simple expression of the complex thought. We offer large shapes, his work was very big, because it has the impact of the unequivocal. We are for flat forms because they destroy illusion and reveal truth. I thought this was remarkable, <laughs> this particular one. His paintings of the 50s are floating rectangles of color which seem to engulf the spectator. Visual elements such as luminosity, darkness, broad space, and the contrast of colors have been linked by the artists themselves to themes of tragedy, ecstasy, and the sublime with the goal of relieving modern man's spiritual emptiness. Rothko believed that the abstract image directly represented the fundamental nature of the human drama. He said, and I quote, I'm only expressing basic human emotion, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. And the fact that a lot of people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures show that I can commute these basic human emotions. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. In his later years, Rothko emphatically emphasized the spiritual aspect of his artwork, a sentiment that would culminate in the construction of the Rothko Cathedral. It is a non-sectarian space designed as a sanctuary for the contemplation of 14 of his monumental color field works. Critic Susan J. Barnes states, the Rothko Chapel became the world's first, first broadly ecumenical center, a holy place open to all religions and belonging to none. It became a center for international cultural, religious, and philosophical exchanges, and it became a place of private prayer for individuals of all faiths. As of September 2000, uh, the Rothko Chapel is on the National Registry of Historical Places.
Krathko was physically ill and, and suffering from depression. And he committed suicide on February of uh, 1970. At the time of his death, he was widely recognized in Europe and America for his cultural role in the development of non-representational art. And his works are in most major art collections around the world. And I found this online uh, as of January, it was January, 2022. Um, the employees of uh, Sotheby's auction house are with, Mar with Mark uh, Rothko's Untitled and it sold for $46.5 million in New York. Rothko focused on the simple expression of a complex thought. Our next artist believed simple colors can act upon the inner feelings with all the more force because they are simple. Morris Lewis was one of four sons born into a middle-class Jewish family in Baltimore, Maryland, in, uh, he, born in 1912. His, his parents were Russian immigrants. Lewis developed an early interest in art. And at the age of 15, despite his parents' wishes and arguments, he decided not to pursue me uh, medical studies and instead accepted a scholarship to the Maryland Institute of Fine and Applied Arts in 1927. During these early years as an artist, he was influenced by the paintings of uh, Paul Cezanne. After graduating in 1932, he worked in Baltimore for several years, becoming president of the Baltimore Artists Association. In 1936, he moved to New York, where he worked as a window decorator. And then in 1938, he began working for the Federal Art Project of the WPA. Lewis's closest friend from college described Lewis as fairly tense, animated, and very bright. Lewis was a heavy smoker, pretty much a loner, and a man totally committed to his art, despite his family's res strong reservations. As luck would have it, Lewis met the influential critic, Clement Greenberg, and we talked about this very antidote. Um, and fortunately, Greenberg became his greatest champion. In 1954, he took Lewis to Helen Frankenthaler's uh, Manhattan studio to see her monumental work, Mountain and Sea, and we saw that last week. Lewis witnessed Frankenthaler's technique as she poured paint, thinned with turpentine, over an unstretched canvas placed on the floor. And it was epiphany for him. He returned to his studio and experiment, experimented with various techniques of paint application. In this painting, he uses long parallel strips of pure color arranged side by side. Lewis characteristically applied extremely runny paint to an unstretched canvas, allowing it to flow over the inclined surface. Um, the most influential review of his work was by Brian Don, Don Hurdy in the New York Times, and I quote, Intelligence and invention in the creation of bands that jostle, squeeze, push, and argue with each other gives each pillar of color considerable optical excitement. This is an attempt of rare intelligence to exploit visual phenomena through color. The critic went on to say, although few people can, who see this exhibit will have any idea of what it's all about. Lewis's work is original, 
spare and strange, extremely simple in form, but complex in aims and efforts. High praise. This is another variety of paintings. This, the, the tet means transcutaneous energy transfer. That's the title up here, tet. His veil paintings, which is, this is one of his series, contains bands of brilliant curving color shapes emerging in transparent washing, washes. Although subdued, the resulting color is immensely rich and suggests kind of trans, uh, translucent color veils. And that's where it gets its uh, title. Lewis died in Washington, DC in September of 62. A memorial exhibit of his work was held at, Saint, uh, at the Salem Guggenheim Museum in 63. Uh, major Lewis exhibitions were also organized by the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in 67 and the National Collection of Fine Arts of Washington, D.C. in 76. And now we're on to our next artist who grew up in profound poverty and created an entirely new artistic um, category. Our next artist's motto was work with what you've got. Robert Rauschenberg, there's his, his uh, very long name, was an American Jewish painter and graphic artist who early works anticipated the pop art movement. He was both a painter and a sculptor, but he worked in photography, printmaking, papermaking, and performance art. He served in the, New in the U.S. Army before studying art at the Kansas City Art Institute, the Academy Julian in Paris, and Black Mountain College in North Carolina. In 1949, he moved to New York um, City, and he stayed there throughout his career. Throughout his career, he was a premium recycler, and his um, motto, as I said, was work with what you got. Growing up in Depression, Texas, his family was so poor that his mother used to sew shirts out of scraps. As a recycler, Rauschenberg himself makes much of cloth, sewing strips together to make paintings, uh, stitching snippets into canvases, he also used newspaper instead of pigment. He created paintings out of latex and dirt and clay. He received numerous awards during his uh, nearly 60 year artistic career. Among the most prominent was the International Grand Prize in Painting at the 32nd uh, Venice Biannual in 1964 and the National Medal of Arts in 1993. He's well known for his combines and this is one of them. It's a group of artwork that incorporates everyday objects in, uh, as art material and blurs the distinction between painting and sculpture. This piece belongs to the series of combines that he made between 1954 and 1964. Combines merges aspects of painting and sculpture to become an entirely new artistic category. The goat is a stuffed secondhand critter uh, and it's standing on a painted pasture of urban decay. It is a gray, gray creature in a shady world. Rauschenberg saw the stuffed Angora goat, the focus of the monogram, in the window of a secondhand office furniture store on 7th Avenue, New York. He paid $15 towards the asking price of $35. 
The title denotes the union of the goat and the tire, like interweaving letters in a monogram. Now, when the monogram was first exhibited in 1959, an art collector, Robert Shaw, generously offered to purchase the work and donate it to the Museum of Modern Art. Except the director, Alfred H. Barr Jr., declined the offer. And ultimately, the work was purchased by the Modern Museum in Stockholm in 1964. Mirth Day Man. This is a accumulating work. It also is developed on a large scale. This is 10 feet by 15 feet. And it was made on the occasion of the artist's 72nd birthday and following the opening of his full career retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Rauschenberg used printed pictures and photographs of uh, this artwork. He, purchased, he produced the transfers by soaking the, uh, the images, the, uh, the photographs, in solution and then transferred them to the paper. The Mirth Man, <laughs> you might have spotted it, has a six foot full body x-ray that he of his body that was taken in 1967 30 years before the x-ray was composed of six contiguous one foot x-rays since no uh, six foot x-ray machine was available He created uh, this um, organization, which is the Overse uh, Rauschenberg's Overseas Cultural Exchange. At the core of Rauschenberg's Overseas Cultural Exchange is Rauschenberg's belief that art can be a catalyst for positive social change. The ROCI project was announced during the United Nations session in December of 1984. And the seven year project funded almost entirely by the artist enabled Rauschenberg to travel to countries around the world where artistic dialogue was being suppressed. The focus of the ROC project was on the protection of human rights, especially the freedom of artistic expression. However, over time, it became, uh, he, what happened was that it began to focus on the preservation of the environment, which proved to be integral to the protection of human rights. Rauschenberg told the New York Times reporter, I try to use my art to communicate that you yourself must be responsible for life on earth. This is a um, poster advertising a Rauschenberg exhibit. And I wanted to take, at the Jewish Museum, I wanted to take a minute to talk about the Jewish Museum in New York. In, New, in America, in the 1960s, the museum that showcased the latest and best contemporary art was located, predictably enough, in New York. But it wasn't the Guggenheim or the Whitney or the Modern Museum of Art. Instead, the epicenter of the latest and best contemporary art was at the modestly and down upstart that the art world insiders affectionately called the Jewish. Mel Bouchard, the artist said, it was, the Jewish Museum, was the most radical place in New York City. The only place you could see seriously installed contemporary art in the 1960s. These shows were groundbreaking and established 
the possibility of a new future. Important things were being discussed at the Jewish Museum that were not being said anywhere else. In 1970s, however, it was no longer risky for prestigious museums uh, to present contemporary art because commercially and uh, prestige, uh, presti uh, commercially and critically, it was now acceptable uh, because the contemporary art was in itself becoming prestigious. Today, Jewish people no longer have to start their own museum. After decades of exclusion, Jews, including those from Eastern Europe backgrounds, began joining the boards of major art institutions. And to this day, the Jewish museum itself is still pushing the idea of what a museum could and should be. Now this fellow, our next artist, was considered to be the grandfather of conceptual art. It was a title he never fully embraced, but it reflected a fundamental unpinning of his work. And it was that the idea, the artist's conception, the I, very idea itself is the art and how it is made is inconsequential. He influenced generations of artists who followed. Uh, uh, Samuel Lewitt was a Jewish American artist who was prolific in a wide range of media, including drawing, printmaking, photography, painting, installations, and artist books. He came to fame in the late 1960s with his wall drawings and structures, a term he preferred to, preferred to use instead of sculptures. He has been the subject of hundreds of solo exhibitions in museums and galleries and around the world since 1965. He received his BFA from uh, Syracuse University in 49, and after his service in the Korean War, he moved to New York and a city in the 50s to pursue interests in design. And he, he got an um, entry-level job in 1960 at the Museum of Modern Art which would profoundly influence Lewitt as an artist. He was at the MoMA for the now famous 1916 Americans exhibit with work by Jasper John, Robert Rauschenberg, and Frank Stella. When he was interviewed in 1993, three about those years, Lewitt remarked, after seeing that show, I decided that I could make color or form recede and proceed in a three-dimensional way. Seeing that show was an epiphany for him. In the 1960s, he began of uh, simple diagrams for his two-dimensional works. And he drew directly on the wall at first, and he used graphite, then color, and then later color pencils. And finally, in chromatically rich washes of India ink, bright acrylic paint, and other uh, materials that could give him this vibrant color. The Museum of Art, um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York gave Saul Lewitt his first retrospective in 1978, um, which is 18 years after his very first job in the museum. Lewitt used the cube as the basis of his practice throughout his career. As a universal form, the cube 
requires no interpretation and on the part of the viewer or the artist and allows the artist to create a multitude of images using only that one essential idea. And this is the best show in synagogue. In the in 2001, Lewitt co-designed his Connecticut synagogue with Steve Lloyd. Note the design appears to be based on the cube. The artist installed a Star of David in his iconic minimalistic style over the arc doors. I hope you can see that. The wit who died in 2007 was described by his wife as a very, very observant non-believer. Keeping in tune with his priorities, he got involved in designing this Connecticut synagogue, mostly because he worried about the prospect of a strip mall synagogue architecture. This artist's uh, intention was to create a work of art which would transcend the visible. And he added that this work of art could not be perceived except in stages. A passionate experimenter, our next artist deals with such problems as the fourth dimension and time invisible, invisual, artistic, uh, uh, plastic arts, and has extended his experiments to apply uh, in the fields of literature, music, education, and art theory. He has become a leading exponent of optical and kinetic art. I, I, what I said at the beginning is that any one of these artists, we could just devote a whole, talk to and Agam, Yaakov Agam is certainly one of those artists. Now notice his name. Okay. Uh, he started life as Yaakov Gibson and he was born to an Orthodox family on the uh, coastal plain south of Tel Aviv. His father was a rabbi who devoted his life to religious study, meditating and meditation and fasting. Rabbi Gibson, Gibstein refused to register Yaakov in a school because there were no openings in a religious school and secular school was definitely out of the question. Consequently, the boy grew up without any formal education and almost without the company of other children. At home, however, Agam absorbed the heritage of Jewish spiritual values and thought, and was particularly attracted to Jewish mystic lore and Kabbalistic studies, as practiced by his father, the learned rabbi. Agam considered himself as the spiritual continuant to his father in his devotion to the study of these values. This heritage remained at the core of much of Agam's artistic philosophy throughout his career. I was curious as to why Agam changed his name. Uh, so I looked up the meaning of Agam, and it means extending far profound, unimaginable intelligence. When one is first introduced to Agam's work, it just counters all the, your acceptable ideas of that art is a fixed piece. It's a fixed image. As one critic put it, he has sought a unique form of expression that reflects reality. Agam is the inventor of the agamograph, a brilliantly colored art form that appears to shape shift before the, human, before the viewer's eyes. 
and a gommagram is an art form that uses optical illusion to create changes when you look at it from different angles. Depending on the position that the viewer stands, a single work ship shaped between several com um, compositions. I first saw an agam at um, the U of A. I, I picked this piece to show you. So you can, if you haven't seen an agam, you can uh, imagine uh, what it would be like. So this is a piece from uh, Palm Springs, and it's a good demonstration of his work. For imagine that you uh, started walking around this. In this work, the art of viewing itself becomes the adventure because it keeps changing. Uh, the viewer must will discover the different pictures contained in this single object, a process of looking that unfolds over time and within a range of possibilities predetermined by the artist. For GAM, such polyphonic works gives form to the notion that nothing in nature is fixed and that everything is merely a fragment of a larger unity. He strives to demonstrate the principle of reality as a continuous becoming rather than a static graven image. For the elaborately elegant early 18th century presidential Paris, uh, palace in Paris, at the request of President George Pompidou in 1972, Agam created a whole environmental salon with walls covered with polymorphic murals of changing images, a kinetic ceiling, uh, moving transparent colored doors, and a kinetic carpet on which he placed this sculpture. The room embraces the viewer. In 1979, the room was moved with much trouble and expense from the ground floor of the palace to the fourth floor of the Pompidou Center in Paris, and there it is where you can find it. There is more than one fountain uh, that he's produced, but this one is a lovely a neighborhood scale artwork. Rather than frozen in time, Agam's work is a state of perpetual becoming. He is known for his three-dimensional paintings and sculptures, including this water fountain in the heart of Tel Aviv, loaded, located in the center of the Esplanade de la Defense. And it was designed to fit into as a neighborhood scale artwork. There is a, um, uh, this is the Agam Museum. Agam said, and I quote, my basic inspiration is the Kabbalah. In this sense, my work are more reality than abstraction. For before the observer is revealed a world that is one yet unique in unity. It is a visual expression of the essence of Jewish spirituality. Agam added, a sense that God is infinite and therefore cannot be grasped or named. And for me, this was the perfect quote to end this series. God is infinite and therefore cannot be gra grasped or named. I'm honored to, that you cho chosen uh, this time to spend your time with me. And I hope you enjoyed this spirit of this talk, which is to celebrate the impact that Jewish artists had on modern art. And I thank you. That's it. So, anybody home?
Thank you. And we look forward to hearing these again in the recordings. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.